Section five of the Seen and the Unseen by Richard Marsh. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sonia. Three, a pack of cards. Part one. You see these? They belong to Francis Farmer, Colonel Farmer. He called himself the Colonel. He was known as among his pals. Did you ever hear of him? I could not say that I ever had he was a cart himself the colonel was an american he had had something to do with the army once upon a time i fancy but he had had more to do with the police he was one of the greatest swindlers of modern times an artist the colonel was and these are some of the implements of his profession i was paying a visit to the rogues museum at scotland yard that queer establishment in which they preserve mementos of criminals who at various periods have in some way or other had dealings with the police the constable who was acting as my cicerone was holding in his hand a pack of cards i took them into mine they were a pack of what are commonly called squeezers they had rounded corners and in the corner of each card was a statement of its value such a pack indeed as is generally used by properly constituted persons for the game of poker there was nothing about the cards in any way remarkable so far as i could see except that on their backs was painted a large bluish-red rose as it seemed to me by hand but according to the constable they had a history the colonel won thousands with those cards by the exercise of his skill it's as you choose to call it they're hand painted i thought they were and excellently painted too if you look at them closely you'll see that the rose is not placed in exactly the same position on the back of each of them there's just a shade of difference i did look at them closely it was as the constable said but it needed good eyes to observe the fact the difference in position was so slight he used to travel up and down the line to brighton that's odd i'm going down to brighton myself by the two thirty this afternoon i live there ah he was well known upon that road they used to think he was a big pot in the city who liked his hand at cards city gentlemen often have a game as they come up to town it's a regular thing it was a well-known pack the colonel's he won his fare and a bit over many a time and where is this enterprising person now he's dead that's where he is francis farmer was sentenced for the term of his natural life for attempted murder perhaps you remember the case it was on the brighton line they spotted him at last he was a little too fond of winning the colonel was he drew a revolver and put a bullet into the man who spotted him for that he was sent to portland he tried to escape and when they nabbed him he committed suicide in his cell then there is quite a curious interest connected with this pack of cards you may say so there are some very queer tales told about them very queer they say they're haunted i don't know much about that sort of thing myself but some of our chaps do say that wherever those cards are the colonel isn't very far away i smiled the constable seemed a little huffed i only know that i shouldn't care to carry them about with me myself as we were going out a gentleman entered the constable seemed to know him for he allowed him to pass without challenge i went to simpson's to lunch i was thinking as i ate about what i had seen memorials of hideous murders a unique collection of burglar's tools coiner's moulds forger's presses ingenious implements for every sort of swindling a perfect arsenal of crime i am free to confess that that pack of cards was present to my mind what a relic for a man to possess a haunted pack of swindler's cards i ought to have looked at them more closely perhaps some of the victim's blood was on the back of one of them de gustibus non disputandum some men would give a good round sum for such a curio after luncheon i strolled along the embankment to victoria 
I caught the two thirty to Brighton. As I was standing at the door of the carriage, two other persons entered in front of me, brushing past me as they went. When I had taken my seat, a third person entered, just as the train was starting. I was seated with my back to the engine, at the end which was farthest from the platform. The newcomer sat facing the engine at the other end of the carriage. He was a tall, slight, military-looking individual, with a slight moustache, and, as I could see under the brim of his top hat, crisp, curly black hair. The two persons who had entered previously were seated in front of me at my end of the carriage. I had some papers with me, but felt disinclined to read. I had had a heavy lunch, and the result was to make me drowsy. I fancied that I was all but dropping off when someone spoke to me. Haven't we met before? I glanced up. The man speaking was the man in front of me, who sat nearest to the door. When I eyed him closely, I remembered him. He had sat next to me at a dinner, which had been given a few days previously to Lord Labington, whose political exertions, as everyone is aware who is of the right way of thinking, have saved the country. An amusing neighbour I had found him. He had struck me as a fellow of lively wit and of infinite jest. I was glad to meet him again. I told him so. Awfully slow, this kind of thing. I suppose he meant going down by rail to Brighton. He did. This train is a dreadful slow coach. Takes no end of a time. It's a pity, I said, thinking of the colonel's exploits upon that very line, that we haven't such a thing as a pack of cards. While I was speaking, I thrust my right hand into the pocket of the light summer overcoat which I was wearing. It lighted upon something whose presence in my pocket I had not been conscious of before. There were several articles, in fact. Supposing that I had put some things there and forgotten all about them, I drew one of them out to see what it could be. It was a playing card. I drew more of them out. There were more playing cards. There was an entire pack. And could I be dreaming? It was the pack of cards which had belonged to Colonel Francis Farmer. It was entirely out of the question to suppose that I was mistaken. I had seen them too recently, observed them too attentively, and bore them too well in mind for that. They were altogether unmistakable with the hand-painted red roses on their backs. But how came they in my pocket? To describe my feelings when I realized that they really were that haunted pack is altogether beyond my power. I remembered returning them to a constable. I remembered his replacing them in a glass case. I remembered his turning the key in the lock. And yet... I suppose that there was something in the expression of my countenance which to an onlooker was comical, for I was all at once conscious of the sound of laughter. Hello! exclaimed my opposite neighbour. Why... You do appear to have a pack of cards. I... I do appear to have a pack of cards, but... But how I have them is more than I can say. You didn't steal them, I suppose. Not... not consciously. My opposite neighbour and his friend began to laugh again. The man at the other end of the carriage sat quietly cold. How I knew I cannot say but I did know that his eyes were fixed upon me all the time. Never mind how you got them. You have got them. That is the point. Supposing we have a hand at nap? What do you say, Armitage? He turned to his friend. Then to me. I don't know if you're aware of it. I don't think we got so far as exchanging cards the other night. But my name's Burchell. And my name's Rankin. Very well, Mr. Rankin. Supposing after this general naming of names, we set to work? Hand me over the cards. He stretched out his hand. I hesitated before I gave him these. To put it gently, they were not mine. And should I tell him their history or should I not? He did not give me time for reflection. Come along. Are you afraid I'm going to steal them? He took them out of my grasp. I was so bewildered by the discovery of their presence that I had really not recovered sufficient presence of mind to say him either yea or nay. What points? Suppose we say pounds? Pounds? 
i started pound points at nap not if i knew it pennies were more in my line i was pleased to observe that his friend mr armitage did not second his suggestion don't you think pound points are a trifle stiff well make it half sovereigns then and a pound in the pool i don't mind half sovereigns but i did most emphatically why with a pound in the pool i might lose fifty pounds and more before i reached the other end i have played penny nap and risen poorer by half a sovereign i had been up to draw my dividends i wondered what mrs rankin would say if i returned to her minus fifty pounds i i'm no player i i couldn't think of playing for half sovereigns make it dollars then we must have something on the game something on the game if we had five shilling points we should have a good deal more than i cared to have upon the game but without waiting for my refusal mr burchell commenced to deal the cards the colonel's cards i never had such luck before it really was surprising from the very first i won not spasmodically but persistently hand after hand with a regularity which in its way was quite phenomenal it's a pity said mr burchell when i had made nap for the third time within a quarter of an hour that we didn't make it pounds i don't think anything could stand against your cards i have had some decent hands i agreed it's rather odd too because generally i do no good at nap no i should imagine by the way in which you're going it that you're like that third player in punch who held thirteen trumps at whist i laughed curiously enough my luck continued it was quite a record in its way i never lost i always had three trumps do you know observed mr armitage when i again took nap that i am nearly thirty sovereigns to the bed i think it's quite as well we didn't make it pounds i'm about that much nearer the workhouse since i left victoria chimed in his friend i was amazed you don't mean that i've won sixty pounds it looks uncommonly like it it was incredible and yet my luck continued i went three tricks that round and made them then another three then four and then another nap reckon that up and you'll find that with the points and the dealer's ten shilling contribution to the pool i had made thirteen pounds in considerably less than half that number of minutes you will excuse my asking you said mr burchell as he was settling for the nap if that pack of cards is bewitched i think it possible i answered half in jest and half in earnest there is a curious history attached to them at any rate there will be another curious history attached to them if this goes on much longer it did go on in the very next hand i signalled four and made them my antagonists began to look blank no wonder we ought to send this to the field it ought to have a niche among curious games said mr armitage mr burchell shuffled mr armitage cut and i dealt the hand burchell went three armitage four and i went nap i had ace king queen and four of clubs and king of diamonds not a bad nap hand when three are playing what nap again cried burchell great scott never mind said mr armitage i am prepared for anything i was about to lead the ace of clubs when the stranger who was seated at the other end of the carriage left his end and advanced towards ours excuse me gentlemen he addressed himself to my antagonists you are being robbed this gentleman is too clever a player for you i should say that he was a professional swindler what the dickens do you mean asked mr armitage and who are you i'm an old traveller i've seen this kind of thing before but i've never seen quite such beautiful simplicity as yours i do believe you'd let him get napoleon in continuous succession right from here to brighton 
and still think it all serene just a little accident worth sending to the field there was silence armitage and burchell both looked at me i felt that suspicion was in their glances as for myself i was so startled by the enormity of the charge that i momentarily was stricken dumb i could not realize that the fellow was actually accusing me of theft do you do you mean to suggest i gasped when i had sufficient breath to gasp that i i've been cheating that is what i do mean you have hit it on the head it is inconvenient for you no doubt but i am going to make it more inconvenient still i am going to prove it before the sittings ended you you infernal scoundrel i sprang up as if to strike the fellow to the ground but he remained entirely unmoved his calmness or assurance rather reacted on me and i refrained suppose we leave the adjectives till a little later on then it is just possible that each man will have a few of his own to scatter around he turned to my antagonists it's funny gentlemen very but directly i saw those cards i thought i'd seen that pack before i have a good eye for a card the more i saw of them the more i felt that we had met before and now i'll swear we have a pack of cards very like that pack once belonged to a very famous personage more famous perhaps than worthy his name was francis farmer my surprise at hearing this name from the stranger's lips must have betrayed itself in my countenance he immediately turned to me i fancy that is a name which this gentleman has heard before is that not so i i have heard it before i stammered i thought you had yes gentlemen there is the own brother to this pack of cards at this moment in the museum at scotland yard perhaps this gentleman's knowledge of the profession which he adorns so well will enable him to corroborate that fact this this is the pack do tell that's candid now what the colonel's own it's beautiful for gentlemen francis farmer was a swindler a card sharper a thief he had all the talents permit me sir to exploit his favorite pack of cards the stranger took the cards which mr armitage was holding in his hand if you observe the beautiful rows which adorns their rears you will observe that there is a slight variation in its position on the back of every card i don't deny it for a moment i regained my presence of mind when i perceived that the fellow was not a mere impudent vagabond who wished to make himself objectionable but that in appearance he really had something on which to base his assumptions that is very good of you more especially as we have eyes of our own which would enable us to perceive it for ourselves even if you didn't if you will allow me i will explain how i became possessed of this pack of cards which i believe really were the property of the infamous individual of whom this gentleman speaks you will remember that i was surprised when i found them in my pocket i addressed myself to armitage i remember that you appeared to be i did not like his tone at all i not only appeared to be i was but before i explain i suppose mr burchell that you do not require an explanation the place in which i met you is sufficient proof of the absurdity of what this person alleges how so i sat next to you at a public dinner any one could go who chose to buy a ticket it does not require a great effort of the imagination to suppose it possible that one might light upon a doubtful character at such a function 
i liked mr burchell's tone even less than his friend's you scarcely state the case correctly it was not by any means open to any one to buy a ticket however i will pass on to my explanation we are waiting murmured the stranger i was this morning at scotland yard and they let you out again i always said the english police were fools where i saw this pack of cards and pinched it under the constable's nose the man's a genius no sir i did not as you phrase it pinch it under the constable's nose did he give it you no sir he didn't give it me did he sell it you he did not how then does it come here the stranger thrusting his hands into his pockets tilted his head over his eyes that unfortunately is exactly what i am myself unable to understand hark at that and that is what you call your explanation well sir you are the most promising disciple of the late francis farmers i have had the pleasure of meeting you have what made him the man he was his impudence i pay no attention at this moment to this person's insinuations after what has passed i insist on returning the monies i have won that would be advisable it will save us trouble afterwards please to understand that i shall remain with you in this carriage until we reach brighton i shall then require you to accompany me to my residence there i shall place before you ample proof that this person is an impudent traducer and a bare-faced liar softly at that let us wait for the adjective still a little longer there are one or two little points which you have forgotten in the excellent and copious explanation with which you have seen fit to favour us perhaps you will allow me to glance at the cards which you are holding in your hand i gave him them here we have the ace king queen four of clubs and king of diamonds a nice little hand perhaps you will be so kind as to tell me how many cards there are in the remainder of that pack mr armitage being thus appealed to took up the pack of cards which was lying on the seat at my side and having added his own hand and mr burchell's proceeded to count them he announced the result there are forty-two cards here and five i hold make forty-seven it is perhaps my ignorance but i have always supposed that fifty-two constitute a pack of cards perhaps you will be able to tell us what has become of the other five the inquiry was addressed to me how should i know you have not got them by the merest chance in either of your pockets if you are not careful you will go too far that would be a pity i should think that for you i've gone far enough already perhaps it would not be too much trouble to feel say in the left-hand pocket of that elegant summer overcoat which you have on you impudent i stopped short thrusting my hand into my left pocket to my unutterable amazement it lighted upon what unmistakably were cards i drew them out the stranger snatched them from me he held them up in the air hey presto the missing five i thought there might have been an accident now let us see what cards they are ace king queen and four of hearts the ace of clubs another pretty little hand 
perhaps gentlemen you commence to see how it is done i think i do said mr armitage i am sure i do said mr burchell if if you think that i put those cards in my pocket i began to stammer mr burchell interrupted me pray do not trouble to offer any wholly unnecessary explanations perhaps you will be so good as to return the money which you have won he laid a wholly unmistakable accent upon won it is i who insist on that sir not you pray do not let us quarrel as to phrases said mr burchell with a smile a smile for which i could have strangled him i counted out the monies just as i had completed the act of restitution restitution to think that an honest man should have had to endure such humiliation the train drew up at red hill junction it was scarcely more than three quarters of an hour since we left victoria mr burchell rose i wish you good day mr rankin a wish in which i join and mr armitage rose too you are not going i cried oh, but indeed we are then i say that you shall do nothing of the kind do you think that i am going to allow you to place on me such a stigma without offering me an opportunity to prove my innocence if you dare to touch me mr rankin in my excitement i had grasped mr burchell by the arm i shall summon an officer as i am unwilling to appear as your accuser in a police court if you take my advice you will let me go End of section 5section six of the seen and the unseen by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sonia three a pack of cards part two a police court in my amazement at being threatened with a policeman i let them go i sank back upon the seat feeling as though i had been stunned the train started i still sat there my faculties were so disorganized as to render me unable to realize my situation to have had contemptuous compassion dealt out to me as though i were a swindler and a thief it was only when red hill had been left behind that i became conscious of the fact that i had not been left alone in the carriage my accuser remained he himself drew my attention to his presence well how do you feel i looked up he had placed himself on the opposite seat right in front of me i glared at him he smiled had i obeyed the impulse of the moment i should have caught him by the throat and crushed the life right out of him but i restrained my indignation you you villain he laughed a curious mirthless laugh it was like adding fuel to the flame do you know what you have done you have endeavoured to put a brand of shame upon a man who never consciously was guilty of a dishonourable action in his life well and how do you feel feel god forgive me but i feel as though i should like to kill you he put up his hand and stroked his beardless chin yes that is how i used to feel at first what do you mean he leaned forward and looked me keenly in the face do you not know me i paused before i answered so far as my recollection went his face was strange to me still my memory might err is it possible that we have met before can i have given you any even the slightest cause to do this thing you are right in your inference i did it all it was i who put the cards in your pocket you you 
devil this time my indignation did get the better of me i sprang forward to seize him by the throat but with a dexterous movement he eluded me missing my aim i fell on my knees on the floor rising to his feet he looked down at me and smiled do you not know me now know you no i am francis farmer francis farmer i am the guardian of the cards did not the constable tell you that where they were i was always close at hand but farmer's dead that is so he's dead scrambling to my feet i caught hold for support of the railing which was intended for light luggage what did he mean was the fellow after all some wandering lunatic who should not have been suffered to be at large he was standing at the other end of the carriage regarding me with his curiously mirthless smile he did not look a lunatic on the contrary he appeared to be a person of even unusual intelligence he was very tall he was dressed from head to foot in black after the undertaker fashion which is so common in the united states his cheeks were colourless his eyes almost unnaturally bright with those two exceptions there was nothing about him which was in any way uncommon and even pale cheeks and flashing eyes are not phenomenal still i am francis farmer his voice was not at all american it was soft and gentle stooping he picked up the pack of cards he began as it were to fondle them with his hands my cards my own old cards the tools which have so often won for me both bread and cheese is it strange that i should regard them almost as my own children sir that i should be careful where they are to be always close at hand i fashioned them with my own fingers and so fine was the art i used that skilled eyes have beheld them many and many a time yet never perceived a flaw do i understand you to say deliberately that you are francis farmer indeed i am then at the next station at which we stop i will give information to the police so notorious a rogue cannot be allowed to be at large <laughs> but francis farmer's dead he was supposed to be you are not the first rogue who has feigned to be dead but in truth he's dead they sat upon his corpse they brought it in that he'd been guilty of fellow de se and since no one came to claim his body they buried him at portland among his brother rogues and there he lies within hearing of the sea permit me to show you the place where the rope was about his neck and where he thrust the knife into his breast tearing his waistcoat open he advanced towards me as if to show me the hallmarks of the suicide i waved him back again do not think to fool me with such tricks he paused and eyed me always with his curious smile you are a shrewd man i perceived it when i saw you at scotland yard you saw me at scotland yard <laughs> where else i was with you in the museum when you were seeing all the sights and when the constable took out the cards my cards i perceived that you were a man after my own heart so when the superstitious fellow you remember he was a little superstitious was he not put them back into their place i took the liberty to borrow them why not they were my own the works of my own hand and i went with you down the stairs you went with me down the stairs 
and along the strand to simpson's i sat beside you as you lunched you did not see me it was not strange permit me but one word you are too fond of beef it was a meat which in my hungriest days i never loved when you had lunched i slipped my arm through yours you slipped your arm through mine but indeed i did and at the same moment i slipped my cards into the pocket of your overcoat for i liked you although for your beef i had a constitutional disrelish i had a constitutional disrelish for the style of conversation which he appeared to favour as i listened to him talking in that cold-blooded way of what to say the least of it were absolute impossibilities i began to be conscious of a fit of shivering as though i had plunged unawares into a bath of ice-cold water you you don't expect me to believe these fairy tales i went with you to the station then when the train was starting i thought it time i should appear so i appeared i resolved that you should win say sixty pounds and then i would expose you expose me good heavens man or demon why because i hope to find in you a worthy successor to my fame i stared at him aghast what could he mean do you do you mean that you hope to find in me the making of a thief such words are hard i hope to find in you an artist my dear sir you consummate scoundrel man or demon i shall be very much tempted in half a minute to throw you through the carriage window <laughs> try it the fellow stood upright his arms to his sides there was no appearance of bravado in his tone he seemed completely at his ease touch me grasp me if you can i took up his challenge on the instant but scarcely had i advanced a step than i was seized with a sickening faintness so that i was compelled to take refuge on the seat he stood and watched me for a moment then he came and touched me his touch was real enough but i shrank from it with a sense of loathing which i am powerless to put into words see i am quite real strangely enough it was then that for the first time i doubted it it is only when i wish it that i am a thing of air bending over he fixed his bright eyes upon my face his glance had on me that paralyzing effect which is popularly supposed to be an attitude of certain members of the serpent tribe let me teach you the secret of my cards he held the pack in front of me i knew he held it although for the life of me i could not have removed my eyes from off his face so we remained in silence for some moments then he went on his tone seeming to steal like some stupefying poison into my veins this is a great day for me it is a day i have looked forward to ever since i died it was not an heroic death to stab oneself with a common warder's common knife to hang oneself with a prison sheet from the bar of a broken window one would not choose a death like that and yet if die one must what matters it how one dies and time has its revenges all things come to those who wait at last at last after many days i found a friend i tried to breathe i could not something seemed to choke me i was overcome by a great weight of horror 
and disgust it seemed to stifle me do you know where we are sitting you and i this carriage is an old familiar friend it was here i shot john osborne what the sense of loathing even the sense of fear with which i heard him make so callously this hideous confession gave me strength to snap the spell with which he had seemed to bind me to the seat i sprang from him with a cry he was not in the least disturbed yes it was in this very carriage some strange fate has led us hither see he was seated there he pointed to the corner of the carriage which was behind my back turning i glanced over my shoulder with an irrepressible shudder i almost think i see him now ah john osborne where's your ghost would it not be a strange encounter were we ghosts to meet he was seated there i was seated just in front of him behind you on the other side there were four other men with us in the carriage i think i see them would that all we ghosts were met again so that we might re-act the scene before your eyes i had won <laughs> what a sum i'd won john osborne's temper was a little warped he had said a nasty thing or two he did not like to lose i made an awkward pass with an ace of clubs he caught me by the wrist crying got you you thief i looked round the carriage i saw that the others were on his side they all had lost you see i replied release my wrist not he said till you show me that card take it i cried and flung it in his face i have not so sweet a temper as you my friend as i flung the card into his face with my other hand i drew a revolver which it was my custom to carry so that any little difficulties which might arise might be settled without any unnecessary delay i fired at john osborne someone struck up my wrist i missed i fired again that time the shot went home it burst his eye i flattered myself that it had entered into what he called his brain he gave just one gasp and dropped i fancy that i hear him gasping now it seemed as though the passage of his throat was choked with blood there was a fight they all went for me i emptied my revolver and then then i was done he paused and smiled i was cowering at the other end of the carriage close to the spot on which according to his account this hideous tragedy had happened and the chief actor was standing there in front of me bringing back the scene so that it all seemed to be happening before my very eyes a wild desire flashed across my mind that an accident would happen that the train would go off the line so that in some way i might escape this man see here he was holding the pack of cards he advanced towards me with them in his hand i would have opened the door of the carriage and got out upon the footboard if i had dared to turn as i fired a few drops spurted from john osborne's eye and fell upon a card see here they stand as a record unto this day he held out to me a card with this horrid memorial upon its back i tried to close my eyes but the lids rebelled i was compelled to look i have often wondered where that first bullet went with which i missed i was seated there my wrist was struck up so i never heard that it was found it was not produced against me at the trial it must have gone in this direction 
let us see he began at a particular place to prod the cushioned back of the seat with the fingers of his right hand i watched as a man might be supposed to watch with his mental eye the horrors of a nightmare at last he gave an exclamation oh what have we here actually with his fingernails he commenced to pick a hole in the cushion what an officer of the railway company would have thought of the proceedings is more than i can say i could but look on with diabolical dexterity he tore a hole in the cushion and into this hole he inserted his finger and thumb with these he groped about inside when he withdrew them he held them up you see my friend that it is found the missing bullet it is a little shapeless but i know it well he pressed it to his lips he advanced to me the first shot which i fired at john osborne take it and keep it my friend in memory of me it was a nice keepsake to offer to a friend conceive a notorious murderer returning to these shades and offering you as a token of his regard and continuing esteem the hatchet say with which the deed was done no i gasped not i let me entreat you my dear friend he pressed it on me as though it were a gift of priceless worth i won't consider the interest which attaches to this thing it is not much to look at but a little lump of shapeless lead but consider the scene on which it figured oh my friend it might have burst john osborne's eye i almost think it grazed his head the train was slackening thank the powers i thrust my arm through the window of the carriage intending to grasp the handle of the door was i to have this reeking relic forced on me by a ghost he misunderstood my meaning is it suicide you seek it it's escape from you then let us go together how are we to go together if i am to get away from you ah my friend but that you cannot do cannot i at least can try remove your grasp from the handle of that door or i swear that i will not leave you never for an instant night or day till you like me are dead he did not raise his tones but his eyes were strangely light thank heaven the train was slackening fast in a few moments we should reach a station then then we should see he read my thoughts you think to escape me when we reach the station <laughs> my friend i shall disappear but to return again still we should see the train stopped the platform was on the opposite side i made a movement towards the other door he stood in the way unmistakably then he was flesh and blood enough i could not pass unless i forced him to one side in my rage i grappled him for an instant a struggle would have undoubtedly ensued but in the very nick of time the opposite door was opened other passengers came in thank god i cried someone has come at last i turned to see who the newcomers were they were messrs burchell and armitage in my surprise i lost my presence of mind again the stranger stood like a figure of mephistopheles and smiled at me he addressed himself to my late antagonists well gentlemen have you decided to make it a case for the police i think if you will take the advice of an unprejudiced onlooker you would be wise if you did this insolence was more than i could stand gentlemen i cried this 
this demon has confessed to me that it was he who did it all i looked at mr burchell and his friend they met my troubled glances with what seemed in my confusion to be a meaningless stare the stranger still continued to regard me with his careless smile i am afraid he murmured that you're an old old hand what was i to say how was i to refute his calumnies gentlemen you will understand what sort of character this person is when i tell you that he informs me he's a ghost a ghost the exclamation came from burchell i was sure yes a ghost he tells me that he is francis farmer not francis farmer the stranger touched me on the arm you said that you were francis farmer but francis farmer's ghost the difference is essential you will do me the favour to admit that i stated that i was francis farmer's ghost i was prepared to show you where the rope was passed about my throat and the exact spot where the knife was thrust into my breast was he in jest his manner was all the time so calm that it was difficult to tell if he was in jest or earnest if you're not a ghost then you're a raving lunatic if i'm not a ghost he stood close in front of me wagging his forefinger in my face there was silence for my part i knew neither what to do nor say at last taking out my handkerchief with it i wiped the perspiration from my brow i think i'm going mad as i uttered these words in a tone which i do not doubt sufficiently suggested the confusion which was paralyzing my mental faculties there came a sound very like a titter from the other end of the carriage i turned mr armitage was laughing at first it seemed that he was endeavouring to restrain his mirth but as i continued to stare it gathered force until it became a veritable roar his example was contagious suddenly mr burchell burst into peals of merriment and directly he began the mephistophelian stranger bending double sank back upon the seat and indulged in laughter to such an immoderate extent that i really thought that there was imminent danger that he would crack his sides as i gazed at this amazing spectacle i dare say that from one point of view which was not mine the expression of my face was comical enough was i going off my head or had fate destined me to journey down to brighton in the society of lunatics oh man gasped mr burchell between his bursts of laughter <laughs> don't look like that or i shall die i endeavoured doubtless quite ineffectually to assume an imposing attitude perhaps gentlemen when you have quite finished you will condescend to favour me with an explanation of this extraordinary scene if i am not a ghost screamed the mephistophelian stranger and off they all went again there may be something comical in the present situation and perhaps it is owing to some constitutional defect that i altogether fail to see it but i don't oh man mr burchell gasped again don't talk like that or you will kill me all at once he rose and clapped me on the shoulder why don't you see it's all a joke a joke i stared at him could he be joking yes a practical joke my boy a practical joke i fancy that i was the colour of a boiled beetroot perhaps mr burchell you will explain what you mean by a practical joke <laughs> why we three were outside the door when the bobby was showing you the things at the yard and we heard him pitch the yarn about francis farmer and his cards and how they were haunted and all the rest of it 
so we thought we'd have a game with you a game with me still i fail to understand i'm a clerk at the yard you know excuse me but i do not know that you're a clerk at the yard well i am in the criminal investigation department of course they know me and directly you went out i walked in as bold as brass and collared the cards i remembered that someone had gone in as we came out i arranged that bateman this is bateman he jerked his thumb towards the mephistophelian stranger that individual raised his hat possibly to acknowledge the introduction should shadow you he was to play the ghost we had heard you tell the bobby that you were going down to brighton by the two thirty from victoria so we agreed that we would all go down together this happening to be an afternoon on which the exigencies of the public service were not too pressing we found you at the station standing outside the carriage door as i brushed past you on one side i slipped forty-seven cards into one pocket of your overcoat and as armitage brushed past you on the other side he slipped five cards into the other i am a bit of a conjurer and armitage is a dab at all that kind of thing so between us we manipulated the cards so that you were forced to win and you won sixty pounds until the exposure came off in style i say old man how did the ghost go off the venerable mr burchell turned to mr bateman for my part not for the first time on that occasion i felt too bewildered to speak the modest mr bateman smoothed his chin i am afraid that for details of the ghost i must refer you to mr rankin but i may mention that i discovered that this was the actual carriage in which the tragedy took place and that there was a memorial of the victim's fate on the back of one of the cards i also alighted on the identical bullet which almost did the deed what the railway company will say about the damage to their cushion is more than i can guess it may turn out to be a couple of pounds mr burchell i spluttered i was reduced to such a condition that spluttering was all i was fit for i have only one thing to say to you since your idea of what constitutes a joke seems to be so radically different to mine and that is to remind you that you have been guilty of this extraordinary behaviour towards an entire stranger not an entire stranger yes sir an entire stranger but henceforth one whom i hope to be allowed to call a friend he had the assurance to offer me with an insinuating smile his hand i put my hands behind my back there is one other point mr burchell i won from you and your friend nearly sixty pounds i returned it to you on an imputation being made of cheating i presume that imputation is now withdrawn of course it was only a joke in that case i must request you to repay me the amount i won the fellow looked a little blank isn't it rather a curious case it is exactly on that account that i insist on your refunding what you obtained from me by means of what looks very like a subterfuge i intend to present the amount as a memorial of what you very rightly call a curious case to the home for lost dogs a joke may be made a little expensive murmured mr burchell as he counted out the coin and the laugh after all be on the other side said mr armitage the laugh i answered as i received my winnings is with the curse end of section six Section 7 of The Seen and the Unseen by Richard Marsh. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sonia. 4. The Violin. 1. 
i am unable to say exactly why i bought it i suspect that the purchase had a certain connection with the price three and sixpence for a full-sized violin splendid instrument rich tone in perfect condition best bow did not strike me as extravagant in fact it tickled me the shop looked like a marine store dealer's there were old books old boots old bottles and jam pots cheek by jowl with that fine violin had it that splendid instrument been the last resource of a street musician i wondered the proprietor of the shop appeared to be a lady she was very dirty and very fat i asked to see the fiddle taking it from the window without a word she placed it in my hands i am not a judge of violins i should not know an amati if i saw one as to stradivarius ernest told me the other day that violins posthumous violins of his manufacture are being turned out by the dozen cheap at a little town in germany i know very little more about stradivarius than that but ernest does he is a musician and i thought it would amuse him if i made him a present of a fine violin and best bow which together cost me three and sixpence how much for the case the fiddle had been reclining on the lid of an ordinary base lined wooden case shilling said the lady it did not occur to me that this was dear the lady however seemed to suppose that my temporary silence conveyed a hint that it was because presently she observed i won't charge you anything for the case you will let me have the violin the bow and the case for three and sixpence yes said the lady i struck the bargain as i bore away the price it crossed my mind that there was something perhaps a little remarkable about that violin a suspicion say of a receiver and a thief one must purchase violins bows and cases at a very low price to be enabled to sell them at a profit for three and sixpence my morality may have been lax but i told myself that that was the lady's affair not mine ernest came to dinner that night i have been buying you a present i remarked as he came in he looked at me and laughed i don't know if he imagined that my words contained a joke a present what sort of present a violin he glanced at the case upon the table a violin i say uncle i hope you haven't been making a fool of yourself he was on the point of saying but he wisely stopped in time just look at that violin and tell me what you think of it he opened the case he glanced at the violin as it lay within then he took it out he handled it reverently i have noticed that a genuine musician always does handle a fiddle even a common fiddle with a sort of reverence he turned it over and over he rapped its back softly with his knuckles he peeped into its belly he smelt it he tucked it under his chin then putting it down he fixed his eyes on me with a light in them as of a smile it's odd but do you know i seem to have seen this violin somewhere before where have you seen it i fancy you know better than i you have a little secret uncle come what is it is it a good violin he drew the bow across it tightening the strings then he played a little exercise and a snatch of some quaint melody then he lowered it and looked at it with glistening eyes it is a good violin how much is it worth it depends upon the man who buys it and upon the length of his purse i hope you did not give a fancy price is it dear at three and sixpence three and sixpence you are joking that is what i gave for it fiddle bow case and all he was turning it over and over where did you get it in a dirty shop in a dirty street off listen grove i feel sure i have seen it before do you recognize it by any mark 
i recognize it by every mark and he touched it with the bow i recognize it by its voice the idea struck me as fanciful in an orchestra of violins all playing the same music if one among them could be recognized by its voice it seems to me that that violin would not be popular but he is fanciful is ernest we went down to dinner during the meal he told me about a young man in whom he was much interested the name of this young man was philip courceau and he too was a musician according to ernest he was a strange and wild young man poor and proud impracticable too he relied upon his art for bread and his art had failed him nor was it strange from all that ernest said he had composed oratorios and grand operas and elaborate symphonies all the heavy artillery of music ernest declared that genius had inspired them all that unmistakable genius which rings clear and true but an unknown young man cannot go into the market with a grand opera in his hand and have it produced and paid for on the spot especially when that young man is a crotchety young man who has ideas of his own as to the way in which he wishes his work produced so mr courceau found pupils he scorned ernest for instance had found him one or two but his treatment of them was so extraordinary that as a matter of course he lost them he was never punctual he kept them waiting hours sometimes he never came at all and when he did appear he spent his breath and exhausted a considerable vocabulary in reviling them for their musical incompetence and crass-headed ignorance young lady pupils too and in the presence of their mothers mrs jones told him that he need not call again which was not strange of mrs jones who did not pay to have the pleasure of hearing her daughter rated as being lower than the beasts that grovel as i have said my nephew was telling me about that friend of his as we were eating our dinner my dining-room is under the drawing-room and in the drawing-room we had left that three and sixpenny fiddle while the fish was being removed we distinctly heard above our heads the sound of a violin it was ernest who heard it first you have a musician in the house a musician what do you mean for the change of themes was sudden he was in the very middle of the story of his friend some one in the drawing-room is favouring us with a solo on the violin i listened it was as he said the sound was unmistakable some one was fiddling while we dined which of your maids is a mistress of harmony i was not aware that i had such a paragon it is the first i have heard of it just then rouse came in with the entree rouse who is in the drawing-room the question appeared to surprise him i am not aware sir that any one is there is some one go up and see who it is rouse went almost immediately the sound of playing ceased rouse has stopped the concert the man returned well who was it no one sir is in the drawing-room no one is or no one was no one was sir he smiled i glanced at ernest and ernest glanced at me he seemed to be a trifle incredulous then who was that playing the violin i fancy sir that it must have been some one in the street if it was some one in the street then my ears had played me a curious trick i thought it possible that rouse was screening one of the maids i chose to let it pass i recurred to the subject of our conversation well and about your friend he has disappeared disappeared into thin air like that performer on the violin there was a suggestive twitching about the corners of Ernest's lips i am afraid he thought that rouse had been guilty of what may be politely termed a subterfuge more than a week ago he left his lodgings with his violin case in his hand and he has not been heard of since ha there is the performer back again there was 
this time it sounded as though someone upstairs was tuning the violin rouse who is upstairs the man stood listening i will go and see sir there was certainly no one there just now as before the sound ceased almost directly he had left the room rouse has stopped the concert for the second time just as the fair musician was tuning up to ernest seemed to take it for granted that it was a maid when rouse reappeared in the room his bearing was a trifle disturbed there was no one upstairs sir it must have been in the street i kicked at this come rouse that won't do did it sound to you as though it were in the street it didn't sir but it must have been there's no one upstairs and the maids are all below besides sir there is no one in the house as plays the fiddle ernest interposed a smile was twinkling in his eyes where was the violin there's a violin case upon the table sir i don't know if a violin is in it the case is closed i left it closed ernest's tone was dry i could see he had his doubts as to the man's veracity rouse has been in my service nearly thirty years and i do not remember having once detected him in a lie if he was screening any one i would have it out with him when my visitor had gone i did not intend to humiliate a tried and faithful servant in the presence of my young gentleman i returned to the erratic mr Courso. i suppose when your friend disappeared he left a little bill behind you little know Courso. he had the most astonishing notions about money matters some time ago when i knew he was in a tight place i ventured to offer him a loan i never ventured to repeat the offer that sort of thing sounds very well my boy among boys but did he leave a little bill not the ghost of one he paid up his week's lodging the very day he left his landlady says that she believes he expended his last penny in doing so she says too that she believes that he has been starving himself for weeks i myself have noticed that he has become worn almost to a shadow but with such a man as that what could you do the more he needed help the farther he would shrink from it in his uttermost extremity he would owe nothing even to his dearest friend do you know his haunts i ought to none better but he has been seen nowhere and by no one as is the case with our friend upstairs he has vanished into air i did not like the illusion myself as for rouse i saw he winced did this remarkable friend of yours burden himself with any portion of his baggage he took nothing but his violin was that his instrument all instruments were his but it was his first love and his last he used to say of his violin that to him it was mother father wife and friend as i was hesitating whether to smile at the folly of these young men ernest half rose from his seat he pointed upwards with his hand back again as he put it the sound of the violin was back again listen don't trouble yourself rouse to go upstairs and stop the concert but stand a bit and listen let us hear of what metal the performers made we listened the while ernest held up his hand as if commanding silence is that in the street it did not sound as though it were ernest moved a little from the table come let us go upstairs and surprise this fair musician possibly this is the case of a light which hitherto has shone unseen he went to the door he opened it softly so as to make no noise with the handle in his hand he stood and listened hark let us hear what it is she or he is playing we all were silent listening to the music which came floating through the open door uncle ernest turned to me a startled look was on his face surely surely i know that air it was strange to me 
quaint and sweet and mournful like the refrain of an old world song i would i were a musician i would write it here it is a thing of Crusoe's. suddenly ernest threw the door wide open he went into the hall i went with him amused at his eagerness we stood at the foot of the stairs and listened do you mean that it is a composition of the friend of whom you have been telling me i do i'll swear to it i've heard him playing it then possibly he has attained to greater fame than he imagines but it's unpublished uncle courceau is upstairs he grasped my arm with a degree of force which was a little disconcerting nonsense your friend would scarcely carry his eccentricity so far as to enter uninvited and unannounced the house of a perfect stranger that is unless he is burglariously inclined i know his touch do you think that any one but a master could play like that it was fine playing very soft and delicate but instinct with a strength and a force and a passion which was perceptible even at our post of disadvantage at the foot of the stairs a street musician would scarcely play like that and the parlour maid it is one of his freaks he has heard that i was here and thought he would surprise me the presence of the violin upon the table was a temptation beyond his strength it is the man all over uncle let's turn the tables we'll surprise him he began gingerly to ascend the stairs i followed a step or two behind about half way up he stopped i call that playing so did i as we mounted higher the sound was clearer the voice of the violin was sweeter than any human voice i ever heard unwilling as i was to be disturbed at dinner the food spoiling on the table i could not but acknowledge that as ernest said it was the hand of a master which held that bow a moment listening we paused then again ascended sweeter and sweeter grew the music until just as we reached the uppermost stair all at once it ceased he has heard us but never mind he can't escape us ernest rushed forward he threw the door wide open he entered the room curso philip hello why there's no one there there did not seem to be i followed pretty close upon my enthusiastic nephew's heels the room was empty he's in hiding come you rogue where are you we know you're here philip do you think i don't know your touch and that queer song of yours come out you beggar why wherever can he be yes where my drawing-room contains no screen no cupboard not an article of furniture behind which even a child could hide ernest in his impetuous way scoured round the room it was empty i confess that i was puzzled we both of us stared round and round the room as though staring would resolve the mystery rouse was standing in the doorway he apparently had taken french leave and followed us upstairs he spoke there wasn't no one in the room when i came up just now it was the same with me i heard the fiddling most distinct as i was coming up the stairs when i reached the landing it stopped i made sure that whoever it was had heard me and i should find him in the room but when i opened the door there wasn't no one there you see sir although it didn't sound as though it was it must have been in the street in the street you idiot do you think i'm deaf i mildly interposed but my dear fellow there is the violin in its case upon the table it doesn't look to me as if the case had even been opened ernest made a dash at it he opened the lid he took out the fiddle as he did so he gave a start which was quite dramatic he stared at it as though he had never seen such a thing as a fiddle before it's courceau's violin his exclamation startled me courceau's violin it reminded me of mr box's remark to mr cox have you a strawberry mark on your left arm no then you are 
you are my long-lost brother the recognition was too opportune come ernest ernest don't strain the thing too far you recognize it i presume by the catgut and the bridge ernest paid no heed to my admittedly feeble attempt at chaff i am no great hand at badinage he continued to hold fiddle in front of him with both his hands glaring at it as if it were a ghost it's Courceau's violin i thought i knew it when i saw it first i know it now it's phillips how do you know it's phillips he did not directly answer me placing the fiddle very carefully upon the table he stood for a moment in apparent agitation uncle there is some mystery don't laugh at me i dare say i was smiling something has happened to courceau from the character you have given the man the thing is very possible and still there may be no mystery some time ago courceau wrote the words of a little song which he set to music the thing was in commemoration of certain pleasant days which he and i had spent together i am nearly certain that no one ever heard of its existence except we two he called it where the willows cast their shade it is that which we have just heard played where the willows cast their shade rather a curious title for a song but even in titles curiosity seemed to be the mode are you sure it was the same am i sure it was the quaintest thing like all he wrote even the merest trifles peculiarly characteristic is it not strange that i should hear courceau's song whose very existence was known only to him and to me played on courceau's violin i stared do you mean to say that the man has been in this room and at our approach to use your own phrase vanished into air ernest became preternaturally grave he is the funniest lad uncle strange things have happened they have as witness my being disturbed in the middle of my dinner how on earth do you know that that three and sixpenny affair is courceau's violin that is easily solved we will go to the shop at which you bought it and ascertain from whom they got it we went there and then with the dinner not half eaten rouse must have had doubts about my sanity i have declared not once but a hundred times that not for the queen of england would i be disturbed at dinner yet before we had even eaten the entree that young man whom i had invited to dinner dragged me from my own house on a dirty night and put me into a hansom and drove me through the slums of london in search of a rag shop as the vehicle rattled over the stones i reflected upon what could be brought about by the expenditure of such a sum as three and sixpence the rule of a lifetime shattered at a blow the cabman could not find the street i did not know its name how i originally chanced on it is more than i can say i am not in the habit of wandering in the pearl use of lisson grove we went poking out of one hole and into another i should think we must have penetrated at least half a dozen when just as i really believed the cabman was on the point of insulting us we lighted not only on the street but on the shop as well the lady was in the same lady a little dirtier perhaps but still the same my nephew conducted the negotiations we have called about a violin which this gentleman purchased here this afternoon the lady stared at us with a watery a gin and watery eye could you tell me from whom you got it the lady's response was oracular perhaps i could perhaps i couldn't the fact is that i have reason to believe that it belonged to a friend of mine whose whereabouts i am very anxious to discover that don't make no odds to me but it makes considerable odds to me such odds that i am willing to give half a sovereign if you will tell me from whom you got it if for instance he was a stranger to you could you describe his appearance well i could and that's sacred truth good reason i have to remember him indeed ernest's tone was sympathetic 
cause i gave more for that there fiddle than what i sold it for i should think that you are hardly in the habit of doing that are you perhaps this time there was the suspicion of a sarcastic intonation i ain't i shouldn't make much of a living if i was should i i don't mind saying it now i've sold the thing but that there fiddle ain't all there do you mean that part of it is missing no i don't i don't believe in ghostesses nor none of them there rubbishes but if there ain't a ghost about that there fiddle i never heard of one i glanced at ernest ernest glanced at me the lady continued it's got a trick of playing tunes all by itself when there ain't no one there to play em no one there to play them of course you're joking i ain't joking i ain't a joking sort to do her justice i am bound to own that she didn't look as though she were the very first night it played a tune and it's played the same tune every blessed night since it's been in the shop the same tune always the same would you know it if you heard it i ought to i've heard it often enough lord knows and i ain't over and above anxious to hear it again is this it ernest whistled a little air it was the same which we had heard being played as we were ascending the stairs quite an uncomfortable change took place in the lady's bearing hardly had ernest whistled a couple of notes than with a sort of groan she shrank back against the wall that's it stop it it gives me creeps and crawlers now tell me from what sort of person did you purchase the violin a little chap about up to your shoulder the queerest looking little chap ever i see he had long black hair and big eyes ah uh, as big as bull's-eye lanterns and that there wild they made him look stark mad he was that there thin anybody could see he hadn't had a square meal for a month of sundays he says what'll you give me for my fiddle i wondered if it was a swap that he was after do you mean how much money i says yes he says how much money i'll give you five bob i says five bob for my fiddle he gives a kind of laugh though it wasn't the sort of laugh what did you good to hear not by no manner of means i'll take it he says so after all she hadn't given so much more for the thing than she had sold it for i was took back cause i see it was worth more than five bob but it wasn't my business to tell him so hardly i hands him to pieces let me play a last tune upon my fiddle he says he picks it up and he plays that same tune which you've just now whistled he could play he could then he kisses the fiddle and he goes away the lady paused we stood silent i puts the fiddle on that shelf just where you're standing that night i woke up sudden i couldn't make out what it was had woke me then i heard a noise first i thought it was cats but it wasn't no cats it was someone fiddling right in the shop well i says blame their impudence if someone ain't busted in so i comes downstairs without my shoes and stockings on and i stands outside the door what leads into the shop and i listens if it wasn't the same tune the little chap had played if this ain't good i says to myself blow me if he ain't come back after his fiddle i'll fiddle him i has the lamp in my hand and i opens the door sudden and i goes in the lady paused you may believe me or you mayn't but there wasn't no one there never a one i couldn't make it out i tell you that as i was going forward i all but steps upon the fiddle and the bow what's a-lying on the floor now then i says where's the party as put you there believe me or believe me not there wasn't a creature in the place it ain't a large shop you see and i routes in every corner i looks at the window and the door the shutters was up 
and the door was locked and bolted just as i left it i thought it queer but i thought it queerer when the same thing comes the next night and the next and the next it preys upon my mind so not being used to nor yet partial to ghostesses and such like rubbishes that i says to myself i'll get rid of the thing even if i does it at a loss as we were going away i said to ernest rather a curious story that of the ladies ernest was sitting back in the cab he seemed to be lost in reflection very there was a momentary silence i told you it was Crusoe's violin that was philip the queer little man with the long black hair and the great big eyes i used to have fears sometimes that in those big eyes genius was struggling with insanity he was at times so strange starved for a month of sundays philip what a wrench to have parted with his violin how bitterly he must have been amused by her offer of five shillings he played his last tune and kissed it philip we dismissed the cabman at the corner of the square the night had become fine we walked together towards my house we were distant from it perhaps twenty yards when ernest pausing laid his hand upon my arm listen there is little traffic in the square at night all was still he is playing for a second or two i did not grasp my nephew's meaning but as i strained my ears to catch the slightest sound i understood it better for i caught the sound of a fiddle it was very faint so faint as to be scarcely audible but it was unmistakable come said ernest let us go nearer we approached the house in front of it we paused beyond doubt the music came from within and from an upper room the same quaint melody which we had heard before played by a master's hand i wonder why he always plays that tune i was unable to supply the information frankly i was becoming a little bewildered with the lady at the rag shop i had no faith in ghostesses and such like rubbishes but the thing was getting curious i opened the front door with my latch-key an unusual spectacle greeted us as we entered the hall all the maids were grouped together in a little crowd guarded as it were by the stalwart rouse there was no necessity to ask the cause it was the music in the drawing-room rouse however seemed to think that an explanation was required it's not my fault sir i couldn't get them to stop in the kitchen they seem to think that there's a spirit sir upstairs the playing has been going on for half an hour and more don't let me have any nonsense i am ashamed of you are you afraid of a fiddle the cook ventured on a meek remonstrance it isn't the fiddle sir it's the fiddler i drove them down rouse in his sheepishness almost treading on the women's petticoats then i turned to ernest i like the lady we have just been interviewing am not partial to ghosts with your permission this time i will lead the way upstairs i led the way ernest following closely after the music continued always the same quaint air it was pretty but the player must have found that the absence of variety became a trifle monotonous on this occasion even when we reached the landing there was no cessation the fiddler still fiddled apparently we have managed to remain unheard now for your eccentric friend with a quick movement i opened the drawing-room door ernest and i entered almost side by side for an instant after our entrance the playing continued i saw that the violin was raised i saw that the bow was being drawn across the strings but who held the violin and who handled the bow there was no evidence visual evidence to prove if we could trust our eyes the room was empty all at once before we could say a word or offer any sort of interposition the playing ceased the violin and the bow were placed upon the table not dropped but laid carefully down and all was still 
End of section 7section eight of the seen and the unseen by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sonia four the violin two the next day there was a small party on the river the party consisted of three an old gentleman a complacent old gentleman who carried his complacence so far as to allow himself to be cast for the role of gooseberry a young gentleman his nephew and not to put too fine a point on it a young lady this young lady's name was minnie minnie west there is reason to suspect that she was the cause of the party we started it is probably unnecessary to observe that i was the complacent old gentleman from hurley and we paddled up the stream that is to say ernest paddled the young lady steered and i looked on we kept it up some time this paddling but at last ernest drew the boat into the shore we landed a hamper and ourselves we lunched under the shade of the trees while we lunched ernest persisted persisted is the word in conversing on a subject which was scarcely appropriate either to the occasion or the scene the subject of his lost friend and his phantom violin one does not wish to dwell on morbid subjects when one is lunching by the crystal waters but ernest apparently did not see it and oddly enough what he did not see it seemed that miss west could not see either when we had finished and done justice to the fair the young gentleman asked the question do you know why i have brought you here really the question did not need an answer the reply was evident the spot was charming sufficient shade above mossy verdure underneath and all around us except upon the riverside tall bracken which completely obscured us from the vulgar gaze ernest supplied an answer of his own do you remember that air which we heard played upon the violin do you remember that i told you it was a song of Courceau's, which he called where the willows cast their shade i told you too that it was written to commemorate some pleasant days which we had spent together those pleasant days were spent upon the river and the pleasantest of all those pleasant days were spent where we are now ernest as she called upon the young man's name the lady gave a little shudder it must be allowed that his manner was distinctly sombre it was a favourite place with him he used to rave about it in that raving way of his he used to say that here he would like to die and be buried he came here often when he was alone and it was here he wrote that song you see it is here that the willows cast their shade he raised his hand with a gesture which was distinctly gruesome looking up i noticed for the first time that the trees above us were willow trees i wonder why it is that the violin always plays that song and there came an echo from the young lady i wonder as she echoed the young gentleman's interrogation she leaned back against the tree a willow tree and put her hand behind her to pluck the bracken she had to stretch out some distance to do this suddenly she withdrew her hand with a half stifled exclamation what's the matter inquired the younger gentleman he wore quite an appearance of concern being still in that stage in which a tight shoe upon the lady's foot would give him corns most transitory stage too sweet to last i i thought i touched something she looked startled she put her hand behind her rather more gingerly than she had done before instantly she sprang to her feet in a state of most unmistakable dismay ernest there is some one there i touched his hand she stood trembling all over a pretty picture of distress in tan shoes and a white pique gown what do you mean cried ernest you are dreaming murmured i we rose together but he was the quicker going behind the willow tree he parted the bracken with his hands there is by george what are you doing there sir are you drunk why he stooped down good god he's dead suddenly with a loud cry he fell upon his knees 
it's Courceau. it was lying dead among the bracken where the willows cast their shade we thought at first that he had been the victim of foul play but subsequent medical examination showed that he had died of aneurysm of the heart brought on by want of nourishment in other words starvation and physical exhaustion he was nothing else but skin and bone and it appeared that he had walked from london it almost seemed without taking rest or food upon his way for the identical five shillings were found in his pockets for which he had sold his violin the supposition was that when he had sold his violin and played on it his last tune he had started possibly in some spirit of half madness for the identical spot which that tune commemorated and had reached it but to die on the previous evening after that final solo with which we had been favoured by the unseen musician i had placed the violin and the bow in the case and the case upon the topmost bookshelf in my library when i came home from that river party an accident had happened the case had fallen from the bookshelf to the floor in falling the lid had opened the violin had tumbled out the result was that the instrument which must have struck with surprising force against some piece of furniture had been shivered into splinters these we collected and with the bow which was also broken we placed in philip Courceau's coffin the dead man and his fiddle were lowered together into the grave end of section eight section nine of the seen and the unseen by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sonia five the tipster an impossible story one i've done it again this is really rum mr gill tilted his head towards the back of his head philip major had come upon him in the strand standing in the middle of the pavement staring at the fifth edition of the evening glimmer that's what it is rum i can't help thinking you know that there must be something wrong what's the matter well mr gill put his hand up to his mouth he coughed i've placed the first three horses for the chichester handicap here they are large as life mr gill pointed to a paragraph in the paper marianne first the duke second and coriolanus third just as i sent them to my clients mr major laughed that's all right i thought that you professed to send three winners for seven and sixpence isn't it but you don't understand yesterday i done the same i placed the first three in the billingsgate stakes sent them to every one of my correspondents i did upon my dick why mr major i've been a tipster ah uh, i don't know how many years and as for placing the first three even at a donkey race why i haven't come within a million mile of em mr gill glanced round there was something curious in his glance but it isn't only horses there's something up with me all round why he caught mr major by the arm they were by the pit entrance to the lyceum theatre a hansom went rushing by there's an old gentleman with a white hat crossing wellington street that cab will knock him down the cab whirled round the corner an instant after there was a sudden tumult someone had been run over mr major stared at mr gill i say gill i've been like that for the last day or two but this afternoon i'm worse than ever i keep seeing things excuse me sir mr gill stopped and addressed the passer-by your wife's just going to slip down the steps which lead to the nursery landing and as she's in a delicate situation if i was you i'd hurry home the passenger a dignified-looking gentleman about forty years of age appeared to be not unnaturally surprised at being addressed in such a manner by a perfect stranger 
who are you my name's gill sir thompson gill as your wife's going to be prematurely overtaken all owing to a piece of soap which that there careless gal of yours has left upon the stairs i thought you'd like me to mention it gill observed mr major as they crossed the road towards waterloo bridge you're drunk not me i haven't had so much as a drop this day it's something wrong with the works that's what it is i keep seeing visions or something if i'd been a drinker i should say i'd got em but it isn't that i know perhaps you're going to be a prophet after all not three winners for seven and six but the bona fide article that's what i'm afraid of sighed mr gill when they reached the centre of the bridge mr major drew mr gill aside into one of the embrasures come gill i'll give you a chance to exercise your prophetic gifts am i going to sell that picture of mine which the president and fellows have done me the honour to sky in their exhibition at burlington house mr major asked the question lightly but there was a suspicion of earnestness beneath the lightness mr gill paused before replying his eyes looked out over the stream yes you are oh i am am i when next week so soon as that my gill come we're getting on and who will be the purchaser a gal a gal mr major started i presume by that you mean a young lady a dark gal with big black eyes and black hair curling all over her head she'll go up to the picture and she'll say so this is it is it they've hung it as well as it deserves so this is the man who presumes to teach me painting he can draw but he will never paint never then she will look at the picture again and she'll say what a fool i am then she'll go to a table and she'll ask how much the picture is and the man will say fifty pounds and she'll say to herself that's more than the frame is worth then she'll take out a sort of pocket-book and she'll hand over five ten-pound notes and the man will say what name and she'll say briggs at this point mr major started again this time most perceptibly what name she'll say briggs it's a lie it's not a lie she'll say briggs and to herself she'll say i'm not going to flatter him by letting him know i've bought it he's fool enough already mr gill paused mr major stared at him the little man had spoken with a quiet intensity which in its way was most effective all the time he had kept his eyes fixed upon the stream anything more mr gill about the picture about the picture can you tell me for instance whether the name of the lady who is destined to become in so flattering a way my patron really is briggs wait a moment when she goes away she'll tell the cab driver to drive to campton hill gardens again mr major started when she gets home she'll have a letter addressed to mr gill hesitated to miss davidson oh to miss davidson mr major's voice was a trifle husky the handwriting on the envelope will be very fine and small the postmark will be oban mr major caught mr gill by the shoulder gill stop that will do come let's get home gill i should say that you were going off your nut i don't know about going off my nut exactly but there's something wrong with the works i do believe you don't suppose that i believe a syllable of all that nonsense you've been talking it's gospel truth every word of it when they had gone a few steps further mr gill stopped short mr major there's a man coming along the road in a brown check coat who's going to pay you half a sovereign which he owes you as a matter of fact when they had proceeded about a hundred yards along the waterloo road they were approached by a man in a brown check-coat 
which was decidedly the worse for wear who at sight of them pulled up hollo major the very man i wanted to see i think that makes us straight he thrust his hand into his waistcoat pocket in the outstretched palm which he held out to mr major was half a sovereign that gentleman stared at the man and at the coin in undisguised amazement hello aldridge rather unexpected isn't it i thought it would be borrowed money back from me don't apologize old chap i've had a stroke of luck so there you are mr major continued to stare at the coin after the man had gone i say gill this is very queer that's what bothers me it's uncommon queer end of section nine